and welcome to the 16th session of the KIPS Distance Learning Program Current Affairs Newspaper Roundup Session. So today's topic is going to be what are the kind of impacts that the global pandemic will have on the education sector globally in general and in Pakistan in particular. So the pandemic has already impacted the education sector more than perhaps you can understand. You being a CSS aspirant and uh, was under the program of KIPS, understand that KIPS has been shut down for nearly two months now. And that is obviously for, for, uh, because of the global pandemic. And imagine how globally in all countries where the pandemic has taken root, all educational institutes, including primary, secondary, and higher education institutes have been completely closed down. There's a virtual lockdown everywhere and students simply cannot access their university campuses or their teachers the way that they were used to. So the education sector is in a real crisis night right now. But, uh, but as I always believe, there's an opportunity in every crisis to improve the existing conditions and the lot of everyone. So let's see what are the kind of characteristics of the education sector which make it such a susceptible, um, you know, victim to the global pandemic and what are the shortcomings of the education sector which perhaps the pandemic and the ensuing lockdown might just be um, a blessing in disguise to help remove. So first of all, uh, the our education system, majority of it, when it comes to the school education model, when it comes to the secondary and higher education model, they're based on a lecture uh, to lecture and uh, one way communication model. Now, this model is very archaic. It's very old. It's century old, centuries old. In fact, the origin of this, uh, you know, model of education is rooted in the Christian uh, Roman Catholic Church creating charter schools all the way 800 years ago and we have to a large extent followed the same kind of model that was present there 800 years ago in the Roman Empire and we haven't really you know changed it or improved it or brought substantial innovation into it and any change that has ever been proposed in the education sector not just in Pakistan but around the world as well has been very slow moving so for example a good example to illustrate that is the gap that uh, you know, students after they graduate from their university acquiring high quality and, uh, you know, bachelor education and higher education uh, experience after they enter the workforce, after they enter the industry. The industry requires completely different skill sets and abilities, which the universities fail to inculcate in their students, which is why there is a big education sector and industry gap, which is why primarily industries have such program as the uh, graduate training program or the uh, management training program. Now, these programs are geared to basically help the new, um, you know, graduates acquire some basic understanding and, uh, and skills that are required to make a baseline for working in industry, which unfortunately uh, universities do not provide. And that is very true when it comes to Pakistan, right? So, this is a, a problem with education sector that has persisted for a very long time and it the change in it was long due. So secondly, why is the education sector worst? Well, quite obviously, education sector relies upon people to people contact, upon uh, interaction, upon student teacher interaction, student student interaction, study sessions, classes with a lot of students and uh, with social distancing measure in place, even if the lockdowns are lifted and the education sector reopens, uh, we will not really have the kind of education model and the kind of um, attendance and uh, the kind of education environment that we used to have in our education institutes before the pandemic. Because even if we see one person with even a slight flu, we would be very, uh, you know, avert to meeting that person or going close to that person. There would be a constant fear on campuses that there might just be a coronavirus break breakout and if that happens the breakout could you know take over the entire university or a school campus in very short amount of time because there is very close intimacy and interaction between the students and teachers and the staff and the entire population of an educational institute right so this is the primary reason why the education sector is worst hit because uh, it is perhaps the most uh, vulnerable sector, the highest risk sector uh, compared to other sectors in an economy. So there's a lot of uncertainty, um, whereas the future of the education sector is concerned, people are not really sure. 
most experts agree that in the short term the education sector is going to be worst hit and this hit is going to take its toll on the finances of all education institutions around the world and uh, due to that they're going to lay off a lot of their employees so there's going to be high unemployment in the education sector as well and that unemployment is going to directly impact the quality and the quantity of uh, learning and education that takes place in education institutes now where does that lead us so as we, I hope that you already know, there's a digital revolution of sorts coming in the education sector. Now this digital revolution has been overdue for a long time. This has been required and needed in the education sector, but we've never really had it. Even though a lot of universities and schools around the world were shifting to online technologies and digital transformations, but the scale of them were not really impressive and not really what was required to transition from an existing archaic system and model of education. Now, uh, with this digital revolution, uh, to be frank, uh, the education sector was not ready for it. And uh, the kind of uh, revolution that is taking place is uh, not planned, so to speak, and it's not might not be very effective, but still it's changing, edu um, you know, government and professional and teachers attitudes and thinking towards the education sector. So the kind of impact that uh, these changes will have on the education sector are going to be long lasting. So what are the changes that are going to take place through this uh, digital revolution in Pakistan? Well, first of all, personal teacher to teacher interaction is going to be um, worst hit. It will suffer dramatically because now person to person interaction due to social distancing, even in the long term, is going to be very hard and people are going to be very cautious when dealing with other people. So this could be an important catalyst for change uh, in the centuries old model of lecture based learning and one way communication. Perhaps we can now mobilize our digital resources and online uh, tools such as Microsoft uh, Classroom, Google Classroom and many other such platforms to uh, you know perhaps even increase teacher student interaction and uh, move away from one way communication and have a more interactive sort of classroom where there is greater learning and lesser amount of time secondly there is going to be the rise of mooc now mooc m o o c means massive open online courses now we've had moocs for some time now at least for in this decade uh, starting with you know such initiatives as the Khan Academy, as Coursera, as edX, which provide very detailed oriented and uh, very comprehensive uh, modules and courses on very complex, uh, you know, and advanced skills and learning uh, objectives and, uh, you know, for example, IT courses and uh, programming courses. And they are very layered and they have a lot of uh, interactive uh, material and assignments and teacher student interaction. And they're generally very good uh, for learning. People who have engaged in MOOC learning uh, would tell you that they have learned perhaps more in those courses than they did in their university years, which is surprising, but also uh, food for thought, whereas the digital revolution in education is concerned. So distance learning is going to take a whole new meaning, I believe, and we're going to see even more uh, interactive and more meaningful sort of models when it comes to uh, online learning and at least for now the MOOCs were only limited to perhaps more advanced courses and uh, postgraduate courses and skills in learning whereas now it's going to you know transition into the lower uh, education and the secondary education the primary education and other uh, you know stages of the education uh, ladder as well. On a third level, I believe that uh, the rise of 5G technology that is taking place around the world in a lot of countries is going to be an important catalyst to allow uh, a smooth and a steady transition uh, on the digital realm of the uh, education industry. And this is important because the education industry, if it goes digital, requires good technology, requires good internet bandwidth and uh, such access to technology that does not inhibit or limit the capacity of the students to access online resources and learn from them. And finally, on a fourth level, uh, public-private partnership is going to dramatically increase in order to create new solutions and new models uh, for online learning and distance learning programs and uh, education consortiums with government, with private, with NGOs and other uh, you know research groups and think tanks is already taking place in the coronavirus pandemic and lockdown right now where companies are researching 
in how uh, to bring education to the students in their homes. And that is the primary question that has really tackled the education sector ever since the lockdown and the corona pandemic uh, on how to make the digital revolution in education and make it accessible to the students in their own homes. So what are the substantial advantages that we'll, we will see from this digital revolution in education? Well, first of all, I believe that um, access to material and uh, uh, course material and uh, content uh, of learning is going to become at will. So you can access that material uh, whenever you want, how many times you want. So the trajectory of learning and the amount of uh, you know learning objectives that you take away from each learning uh, session or course or uh, video is going to be substantially improved because you can access it over and over again. Whereas in a one-way communication lecture, this, the teacher only repeats something that he or she says important once or twice maximum, right? Secondly, I believe, uh, and this is also relevant to the first point, is that uh, students who were, let's say, shy before and did not participate in their classes in, in the interaction, interactive sessions because they were uh, shy and uh, were concerned about what their classmates will think about them, for example, introverted people, they will have a chance to really interact with the uh, teachers on a more uh, engaging level because now they will not have that fear of being judged by their classmates because they can't hear them on online platforms such as Google Classroom where uh, there can be up to 40 people in one conference and the teacher is giving a lecture and the students have the ability to raise their hand digital digitally and then the teacher uh, has a discretion whether to allow the student to ask the question by opening his or her mic or not now that's a very simple but effective and innovative solution and a lot of those solutions are now coming onto the walls now thirdly i think the education uh, is going to become important in the 21st century in the digital realm because it's it has the potential to improve access to education to people and students who were not really um, present and did not have access to the formal education sector before. So this means that uh, if there is enough connectivity and the uh, availability of internet uh, to much of the uh, you know, um, marginalized sections of the community, they will be able to receive education which the rich people can as well. And that might improve the access to education because right now 2.5 billion, which is uh, nearly one fourth of the world population, uh, children are basically out of school due to the global uh, pandemic. And uh, they need to be taught. This time period cannot be wasted. Uh, digital technologies must be utilized in order to ensure that the learning outcomes that were being achieved when the schools were running as usual, business as usual, can also be achieved through digital uh, platforms and perhaps even more so. On a fourth level, I think that we have enough time focus, attention, and perhaps even resources to bring more innovation and experiment in the education sector to come up with tools which are more effective in teaching their students uh, their the learning outcomes and helping them articulate ideas and in understanding their course material. So in this realm, uh, a lot of international organizations, including the um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and other you know, non-government organizations, non-profit foundations are working on how to improve the access of digital technologies in education, which is called educational technologies around the world, especially to the developing world, to the poor communities in developing world. Now, that is uh, for the advantages. So what are the kind of disadvantages or challenges that we face that we have to overcome in order to uh, ensure this digital revolution is inclusive and helps us uh, take the next leap as far as our education models are concerned and how should we address these shortcomings. So first of all, I think one of the most important challenges or hurdles in bringing a digital transformation, especially in poorer regions and poorer countries, is access to education technology such as laptops, uh, good internet connections, bandwidths, and uh, you know technology eligibility, which means that you need uh, an entire list of important things and uh, skills in order to uh, you know, utilize uh, digital education. That includes hardware such as laptops and computers and webcams and mobile phones and good internet connection. Now, all of these things are lacking in many parts of the world and only uh, one statistic says that only 60% of the population of the world is online right now. The rest of the 40% of the population has no access to internet. Now, that is a big crisis and if the education sector is, is going to take the next leap, it must overcome this crisis of lack of access to internet 
Act and Education Technologies. Now, this is where a broad based and comprehensive government support is needed in order to ensure that technologies reach where they are most uh, needed. So, for example, the Digital Pakistan Initiative started by the Pakistan Tariq in Insaf government is a good starting point. If they're able to implement it in letter and spirit, for example, through the uh, $1.2 billion um, internet, uh, you know, linkage and connectivity project under the CPEC uh, umbrella that is already uh, happening from it's connecting Xinjiang to Islamabad and then to Lahore is going to be an important step in bringing the next internet revolution in Pakistan and, and uh, bringing more people online. And that is especially important for the education sector and the digital realm of the education sector, which is perhaps something that's going to become even more important than the traditional education institutes and their big, huge campuses. Uh, second of all, an important challenge is going to be resistance to the adoption of new technology. Now, you might think this is not a big challenge, but go ahead and ask your father to install an app on his phone and then use it to its full uh, functionality. He will be baffled because he simply doesn't know how to use it and he will not put the amount of effort that is required in order to become legible in that application and in using an app his Android or uh, Apple phone because he, he thinks that it's not important to him. His business model and his life does not depend upon using such technologies. Whereas our lives, the uh, millennial generation and Z, Z generation, our lives do depend on them. But at the same time, education technologies can be hard to understand and implement uh, on a scale that is required to bring digital transformation and revolution in the education sector. So in that, I believe once again, uh, non-government organizations and uh, welfare foundations and the government need to collaborate in a public private partnerships and make consortiums in order to train not just teachers, but students in using digital technologies to ensure that the access that has been provided to these technologies by different initiatives is utilized to the maximum effort to improve learning outcomes of the students. And finally, and this is very important, I believe that uh, the global pandemic and a digital revolution in education is going to heighten the inequalities that were already present in the education sector, especially in the poorer countries, in countries like Pakistan, which have a dismal public education system, which is in shambles, which is in, uh, you know, a state of disrepair. And uh, there are huge private networks of education institutes, which are only accessible to the rich, to the elites, to the upper middle class, higher income households, whereas the lower income households are at the worst end of the stick because because they do not have access to quality education and they do not even have access to internet or any technology that are required uh, for utilizing the digital platform, which is why uh, a digital revolution in education is going to heighten digital inequalities. And digital inequalities in the long term will definitely translate into uh, augmenting socioeconomic inequalities that were already present. And that is a big challenge and perhaps the most important challenge that the governments collectively around the world and international funds such as the World Bank, which is a primary funder of education products in Pakistan, for example, need to collaborate on in order to ensure that access to technology, access to internet and access to digital resources in education are universally available. And I believe that it should be made a, a fundamental human right. It should be incorporated into the universal Universal Declaration of Human Rights to have access to good internet and to have access to digital technologies in education. Uh, now, I have added a short um, outline of this, you know, lecture in the description of the video as well. Do watch it. And from now onwards, I will be adding outlines of each of my lecture in the description of the videos as well. And naturally, like previously, relevant links and videos. So keep tuned in. Thank you very much for your patience. Take care. Allah Hafiz.